James, you put up that, welcome back to face, you put up that chart about a silver coil. Uh, did we break out the upside and then give it back? How are you, buddy? Uh, I'm good. Uh, yeah, that was a couple of days ago I sent you. Yeah, that was yeah. a chart that shows, um, you know, it's a long-term chart that basically just shows a huge coiling. Ever since silver ran after COVID up to 30, it's just been coiling. All right, so we're we're still in the formation, or did it poke its head out of it first? No, Let's I didn't see get it. There. it Let's yeah, see it. let me uh, let me share my screen here. That, that's a beautiful uh, a symmetrical triangle. Um, yeah, really, yeah. you know, textbook. Let me pull it up here. Give me one second. It's good to talk oh, to you uh, again, buddy. Yeah, it's good to talk to you. And, um, it's been uh, it's been pretty exciting in terms of uh, oh yeah, gold and silver. Yeah. It's, um, you know, all, all things fundamentally look sound, and, and now we're actually starting to see some price action follow up on that. So that's always nice. To, Even you know. the miners are popping, and they're not giving it back on down days in metal. What yeah. Think of that? Yeah. I, you know, in the end, I, again, I've always been really bullion first. I think the mining sector has underperformed bullion since 2007 overall. There's been a couple of times, you know, where, where miners have outperformed you know, bullion in general, but that those have been short and brief. And I think yeah. that's going to continue for a little longer, at least until we go into a mania phase. And then, then during the mania phase, you'll see miners who really start to, to re reassess themselves. I mean, reassert themselves in terms of performance on a relative basis, you know, but again, that's like throwing a dart at a board, you know, good luck because some of them won't do anything and some of them will outperform everything. So uh, that's just, you, you kind of throw gambling cash at that. Yeah, I Here's love that, that formation. Uh, the low happened in COVID, the bottom yeah. green line, right? Around 12. Yeah. And then the yeah. high up around 30. So that's 18 bucks. Looks like a breakout above 27. That gives you yeah, $45. I mean, the, the, dollars. The, huh? lines are, the lines are really not that technical. I just showed you the coiling. The range yeah. between the low and the highs, and you can see it's just getting tighter and tighter. And, and that's... That's generally a sign of a market that's about to break out. And and yeah. once you get over 26, 28, 30, once you clear 30, that's like the most important number uh, in the medium term, basically. And it's possible by the end of the year that 30 could be threatened. We'll see. We'll see how it goes with the rate cuts and stuff. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's got the look of something that's about to blow. And that basing sets up a, a situation where you could have a run in silver that lasts for a formidable time. And you know what else I see? I see one drive in 79, another drive in 08. And, yeah. you know, I'm a big believer in the three drive formation. So there's uh, one missing, which means we have to take out the high from 2011. Was that it? Or 09? Yeah, you got your, you know, this is, uh, I'm guessing he's got this data based on quarterlies. I'm not sure exactly yeah. what he's using, but, um, you know, the old 1980 high is still a high in the futures market. Yeah. I think 52 and near 53 yeah. uh, was a high. And 2011, it, it got near 50, but it, it maybe in futures it got over 50, but it didn't eclipse the 1980 high. And you're talking about a precious commodity that, you know, you can look at any, virtually any commodity market and there's nothing. That's priced below its 1980 high, and um, silver has just been, you know, it's been the most suppressed and and systemically uh, rigged market. I would argue, and, and, you know, pretty much you'd have to go back all the way post post Civil War era to like the crime of 1873, where silver basically got demonetized, and, and pretty much from there on in, it's been it's been one era or another of, of suppression of value in silver. There's been a few pops. I mean, the seventies was one where they let it go. Uh -huh. and they came yeah. running in in January, 1980 and said, no more silver longs. Halt. Yeah. And, I was know. in the business said, you, you must have read about it. You're too. Yeah. Young. I mean, I've totally read about it. I've done research. I've interviewed people who were covering the markets then Jeff Christian, a CPM group, uh, basically yeah. said the Hunt brothers is a scapegoat and they only added maybe a few bucks here or there in terms of their actual buying and selling. I mean, they they uh, they were smart in the beginning. They went physical bullion, and then they got greedy at the end and went levered long and didn't realize that the rules of the comics, uh, you know, basically set the system up. You're right. The, they they had, changed had a, them. Yeah. They changed yeah, them to liquidation only. Yeah. So they didn't understand what game they were playing, and, and they got taken. So, yeah. um, but this is a different game. This is not, 
you know, one one group of, of guys that you can scapegoat. This is uh, we're talking about sovereign level here. So we're, we're going to go through some slides to kind of understand the bigger picture. Uh, I know that most of your guys who are on these calls are more, more short term orientated, but I'd, I'd like to take the long term view so you understand what cycle of bull market you're sitting in uh, and which right. cycle of bear market you're uh, you're experiencing. Um, this is uh, just simply long-term bonds. Uh, and, and, you know, basically in the last few years, you have central banks by their actions showing you what they're doing, which is buying bullion over bonds. Uh, you have the largest amount of, of official gold bullion buying uh, on record in the last two years. Uh, it's mostly gone east. It's mostly gone, I would say, China probably. And then there are some eastern nations in the EU, for instance. Uh, Poland's been buying. Czech Republic's been buying. Um, so, so you have a situation now where uh, governments are obviously moving toward bullion on the bonds and, and diversifying in their uh, in their sovereign uh, savings. Uh, let's see. The, one other point. Poland might other. be worried about uh, Russia and also worried about the fact that the U.S. is dropping the ball there and they're next. Yeah, I mean, Poland, if you look at the way that they've acted in the last, you know, five, ten years, they are, they're going to be threatening Germany in terms of a manufacturing powerhouse in the coming decades. I mean, they've done yeah, a lot I of... I about it being a, an economic miracle. Yeah, Poland Poland has reindustrialized, and they're going to become a, a major power in the EU in the coming years. Interesting. I, I would expect. Okay. It wouldn't surprise me to see them rival Germany in terms of manufacturing base. Should we uh, buy some uh, Zlotny? <laughs> Huh? Well, you can How about some pierogies? Pierogies <laughs> for Easter. You know, what's funny is that their 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 gold buying in that in that country is pretty strong. And just just anecdotally looking at some of the um, surveys there, the young kids are buying gold there as well in high volume. Uh, I think a lot of them are taking cue from the government and their leaders that uh, buying gold makes sense. And in the EU, you have zero VAT there, so uh, it makes oh. sense that they would be buying gold versus silver, which has a uh, I think it's 21% VAT added on, which is kind of prohibited for any investment. Wow. Why Why would they put the VAT on silver? So the EU, silver. EU wants control uh, of their citizens, and they don't like people having too many sovereign savings. And, you know, the idea that it's spent on silver and call it a commodity and, and, and put a 21% VAT is handy in doing that. I mean, the gold thing, they, they never got around being able to put VAT on gold at least. So people in the EU can buy gold without tax, which is nice. A lot of those countries too, you can sell the gold without capital gains, depending on the type of bullion you own, um, but not so much in silver. If you live in the EU in silver, you're better off probably holding it offshore in a non-bank vault. Secondly, you could maybe get it in a closed-in fund like a PSLV or something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I so, didn't know that. See, I, I always learn from you. <laughs> so this is a uh, this... market better than anyone I know. So the physical one, yeah, like, I mean, look, I, I just saw yesterday Wisdom Tree, the uh, European silver ETF. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah, SIVR added 30, almost 30 million ounces out of nowhere. So there's obviously capital flows in, in silver uh, in, in Europe going into ETFs. Um, SIVR is just another unsecured silver ETF. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's not as big as SLV, but it's, it's another one of those funds that you basically put your capital in to get short-term price exposure to silver. I think if you if you read the prospectus of any of those uh, ETFs, you're going to quickly realize you don't own a single ounce of the stuff. You're an unsecured secured creditor. And basically what you own is an underperforming derivative that uh, tries to track the spot price of silver or gold, what have you. Yeah. So I mean it's it's you know it's it's something for a short term trade, maybe medium term if you can if you can stomach risk. Um, but ETFs, I think, were systemically set up for uh, what's been happening in the gold market really of late, which is and silver market as well, which is essentially to have uh, a place, a slush fund, to pull out bullion bars in order to move it to across the world and, and basically use your shareholders as uh, the the product. I mean, basically, if you're buying an ETF, you're the product. Uh, that's generally how it works. And the un underlying bullion that's supposed to be backs this stuff. The APs of those ETFs will use that bullion uh, at certain times to profit and, and take advantage of premiums. You think Larry Fink is doing that with the Bitcoin ETFs? 
Of course. I mean, these people are all the same. I mean, in the end, they're driven by profit. You know, so yeah. go, where's the profit? Go look there. Okay. Uh, here we are with the 10 year bonds. Uh, it's a bond bear market. I, I don't understand why anybody would think otherwise. I, you see the drawdowns happening here. And the blue line is the UK in the 70s. And I think the United States is going to mirror a lot in terms of what the UK went through in the 70s with massive inflation coming from the United States as well. Uh, being the reserve currency that's slowly losing that that status as time goes on, we'll probably end up in a situation in the world where the dollar will still be important, but it won't be as strong as it once was. I mean, we've run through a secular U.S. dollar bond market, uh, a bull market for what seems almost, I don't know, I have to go back and look, but the, the bottom, I think, was 2008. So it's been 15 years and you have gold in a relatively strong dollar environment you know, breaking through to yeah. new all time highs. Great point. What happens? I showed that this morning. Uh, yeah. Uh, and normally equities sell off with a strong dollar. They haven't either. Yeah, so what happens in a bond bear market that lasts for a decade plus? You know, what does gold do? I mean, that's the that's the question. And that's the time that you're probably looking at, you know, in the coming years. Because, I mean, fundamentally, the dollar, you just look at the deficits of the government. I mean, it's every 100 days they're adding the truth. To the deficit. Yeah. I mean, that type of stuff at some point is going to have a, a real problem in terms of relative value for the dollar. Confidence. Uh, let's move on to this one. Well, they say about confidence, it's gone when people realize the con. Yeah. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's the thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's just. Yeah. I've had a few of those incidents. <laughs> So I was looking at this chart earlier. I mean, this is just your longest, longest term gold chart. It basically goes back well before the United States is even founded. But the flat line under there is the $20.67 fixed price that we had in gold for a long, long time in the United States. I mean, the majority of United States history, the price of gold was $20.67. Right. Uh, it's only been really since, I mean, there was a blip there in the greenback area during the Civil War. I see it. Where, where gold went crazy because... Uh, yeah. Because of all the amount of issuance of greenbacks that were out there, and we had this uh, huge panic in Black Friday on Wall Street. Um, but that was that was one time where 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 basically gold longs in the derivative market won and won acutely for a long run. Um, we had that happen in the seventies, and we had it happen in the two thousands, and it's starting again where gold longs are going to be consistent winners. Yeah, you um, know this this could be. You look at this; it's so long term. Yeah, that, and we've already had a couple of waves. You know, maybe we're in the third wave here. And the, you know what they always say: the biggest gains happen at the end. Yeah, yeah, like ninety percent of the move happens in the last ten percent of time. Yeah, yeah, you know, of course. Yeah, I mean, it, it eventually, like who used to say it? Um, it's the guy that all the. Uh, Conservatives hate. He's a trader who took on the Bank of England. I forget his name. Oh, Soros. Yeah. So George Soros in like 2010 or so or nine uh, came out and basically said gold is the ultimate bubble. And at the time, it, he he was referring to the fact that it's going to be the final bubble of this entire post World War II debt super cycle. But he didn't oh, clarify that when he said oh, it. He okay. said it, and basically anyone listening started freaking out and calling, you know, calling me on the phone and being like, Soros, this is a bubble. And, you know, I, <laughs> it's like, it's insane, like, like to yeah. try and explain that yeah. to a retail investor over a phone yeah. and in their emotion, you know, so. Yeah. Isn't, uh, it yeah. to deal? Isn't it fun to deal with, it? do they have clients? <laughs> it's always fun dealing with people who have not been financially <laughs> educated by design. Yeah, that's always well. Fun. You do. I, I I guarantee you, they learn from you. No, they do. Uh, that's that's very. That's a large part of my. Um, basically, a lot of my job is to educate people on my view, and you know, if they yeah. they they do their due diligence and find it a can, and maybe they follow my lead. But that's my job essentially. How's uh, life in the, the mountains in Panama? It's good. Uh, everything is good. It's luckily. Uh, Luckily, you know, there's been no, no strikes of late, no political issues going on, and, and everything's fine. Goods and services are flowing fine. The dollar's doing just fine. It's been a good place to live the last five years. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, for me, when I look at this place, it's some it's a place that I wouldn't hesitate to retire in. I mean, I actually see why so many 
boomers came and moved here to retire because it's uh it's rather nice yeah he'll be away from all the chaos uh totally and and, it's, and and uh politically this fall yeah and you don't have the problem with, with currencies like for instance costa rica is overpriced uh you know i mean colombia is dangerous uh here it's pretty ideal that's basically the way i describe it if someone comes here it kind of feels like you you move back in time into like the 1990s or, or 1980s in terms of 1970s almost in terms of the way the family structures are and the way that people yeah. behave. But you also have your technological gadgets from 2024. So pretty much everything you need to, to do business is there. But but in terms of uh, the way the culture works and the way that people a- act, it's uh, yeah. it's, it's yeah. a lot more respect. So much hatred here between people. Um, yeah, luckily, luckily we don't have to deal with much of that. I mean, they have their own issues here. Don't get me wrong. I just don't get it. You know, I, I stand outside. James is in the mountains, Charles. <laughs> You're in the mountains, right, so we're bro. Yeah, so the, the North Highlands in uh, Panama. So there's an area called uh, Bukete, uh, about a mile high, and right behind us is a volcano. I'm not even going to start to tell you what happens. What happened the last time the volcano went off? It was. Uh, you didn't want to be here, so uh, I'll, I'll always be ready to leave at any point if there's an earthquake and a volcano. So yeah, so there is always something, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, of course. No places, uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Where's paradise, bro? <laughs> it's Where to just you know just uh, build a house, uh, stack bricks. It's after build this, our house. It's after right. this lifelong test we're under. I, I promise you that. All right, All so right. we're we're gonna look at a long term silver chart here. Uh, this is yeah. this is a similar you know yeah. span of time that we looked at the gold one. You know how I mentioned the crime of 1873, and you can kind of see that in the in the line after the Civil War pop. What uh, was the crime? What was the crime? So the crime of 1873, which is about right here, uh, where it's 1873. What was that guy's name? He wanted to go to a silver stand. Yeah, that's the. Um, uh, I forget the guy's name. He ran for presidency in like yeah. the late 1800s. Uh, yeah. It's going to slip my mind, but I mean, that's what the Wizard of Oz was written about. I mean, if you go and read the original Wizard of Oz, the slippers were made of silver. You know, the, uh, the all the different characters, the the Tin Man and the, and the Scarecrow. Yeah. They were all, you know, that's the farmer, the, the manufacturing base, all the people who were workers in the, in the late 1800s who basically got screwed when the Bryant. The William James Bryant. You got it. William Jennings Bryant. That's it. Jennings. All right. Yeah. I, was, you know, I will not be crucified on a cross of gold, right? That's speech. Yeah. Oh, uh, wow. So yeah. so they basically demonetized silver because the Northeast bankers were in cahoots with the English and the England English bankers. And so when you demonetize silver, basically all the debts had to be paid back in gold. And the Westerners out there had a lot of silver, but not so much gold at the time. And so it's basically a consolidation of the Western United States at the time. So that basically that box there that you see is, is that era. I mean, okay. basically anybody who moved out West and who had debt ended up selling their assets for pennies on the dollar, you know, to, to large conglomerates. So it's just another example of the way that the financial system often shears uh, people in, in, in short durations. So this is a long duration, but the, long, the, the further we move in time, the faster those things happen. I mean, basically... Just for instance, the COVID era was another example of certain shearing. There were winners and losers, yeah. and there were big losers. I'm talking about people losing their lifetime savings, and then there was other people pilfering the treasury and getting away with it. So uh, that happened over a few years' time span, and we're looking at something that happened over decades of time spans. So things are happening in a faster way, but they are rhyming in, in certain ways. So yeah, when, when we look out at silver, we're looking at we're looking at an era where the price was basically controlled in, in various in various edicts and mandates from the government and the demonetization. But as soon as as soon as we went free floating the U.S. dollar, you know, silver took off, and so you can see you can see what happened after that. That basically occurred. I mean, oh, silver that's business then. That's yeah, where exactly. Walker came in too, right? And so silver shot basically from like a dollar 29 or so up to 50 50 bucks so i don't know 38 fold or so from bottom to top yeah um <clears throat> and we already discussed how the comics longs were, were based you weren't allowed to go long by january 21st 1980 they yeah. basically changed the rules so that they could stop that market from from going because I mean, at the time the u.s dollar was literally uh, 
was threatened to, to, to be ruined by gold and silver exploding so high. I mean, gold was so priced, was priced so high in 1980, 81, 82, that the amount of official gold reserves the United States had, the value of it uh, was larger than, yeah, than, than the amount of currency that was out in supply. So basically, yeah. we could have gone back on a gold standard had we so chosen at the time. Yeah, but, uh, it peaked on the uh, does isn't doesn't history rhyme? The Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, Afghanistan. They lost too. Yeah, yeah. We didn't learn from their lesson. <laughs> and here again, we've got the uh, you know the two thousand. Let's just move over to that real quick. The two thousand to two thousand eleven run, basically running from I don't know, whatever that is, like four. just a four, four bucks to fifty. And that was I, I would argue the first leg of this twenty first century secular bull market that's happened in silver. Uh, obviously, 2011 to 2019 was awful, um, but uh, but the pop that happened from COVID that that still that energy is still being stored, it's still coiling as we discussed. You're right, and uh, that is going to that's going to have to play out at some point. I just don't know exactly when, obviously, but but it's getting closer and closer each 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 one of these bars we we set up, and when bars are getting from wide and long to short and short and coiling and coiling. And that tells you that energy is being stored and something's about to explode. You're a hell of a technician too. Well, I, I would tell you, I'm pretty good technically at looking at long-term charts. I don't really do the short term as much because I'm just not a huge short-term speculator. I can do a few trades here and there. I could- Well, I, plus pressure too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I would do it perhaps- You don't seem like a guy that likes a lot of pressure. I don't like to lose my money. I'll tell you that. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, one thing we're I getting one. We're getting uh, one question from Sean, and then the people also want to know how to find you. You okay. have views on platinum and palladium. Yeah, I, I, palladium already kind of did its run. You could tell that that was going to happen because they rated palladium ATFs uh, before. Yeah. And NYMEX got raided, and all of a sudden there was a shortage, and it, and it simultaneously hit the same time as that Volkswagen diesel scandal. So all these yeah. companies stopped using platinum in, in, in their manufacturing and switched to, to palladium at the same, same time okay. when it just wasn't that much. So you had palladium run from about what, 600 below to 3,000. So yeah. you know that was a pretty good run, and, and now it's down toward 1,000. I, I, that platinum and palladium are going to meet pretty soon, and, and Generally, historically, platinum should be more expensive than palladium for various reasons. But and platinum, gold and yeah, gold historically, of course. the idea that palladium was much more expensive than than gold, like twice almost as expensive as gold, is is pretty ludicrous. Crazy. That's how I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I yeah, platinum, plat platinum trading at one two thousand dollars premium to gold. Yeah, it, it got double the price of gold in the 2007 eight, I believe. It got yeah. like 2300 or so. And at certain points, it, it almost got double the price out of gold. Yeah. Long, historically speaking, I mean, platinum and palladium meeting one to one is a pretty common ratio. And uh, and I think in the future, after gold's done its bull market mania, that, that probably happens again because platinum is, once you, once you study it in terms of what it's used for and what it could potentially be used for. I still think we're kind of cavemen in terms of what it's going to be applied to uh, in the future in terms of uh, um, uh, electronic applications and other things that yeah. we're going to use to go inter interstellar. We're going to need platinum for sure, and there's just not that much of it. It's uh, long. So do you, do you buy it? Do, are people buying? I, I, I think platinum is is a minor portion of someone's bullion portfolio. I have okay. some platinum because I just think at uh, eight or nine hundred bucks or whatever I got it at. It's just cheap if you look at a decade or two from now. Right. Uh, yeah. And so it's one of those things you you buy it, forget it, and just put it put it way, way back in the safe or whatever, and you just don't think about it. And you know, once it starts really moving, then then you bring it back to market and sell it. I mean, it's it's a pretty simple trade, but it's a long term one. It's not something that can look to happen in the next year or two. And a long term target on the gold silver ratio. Oh, uh, the gold silver ratio is dipped to so the low 30s in 2011 is, I think, conservative target ultimately before this this coming bull market okay. media phase, phase pays out. So, so to see gold silver ratio fall back in the 20s uh, would not surprise me at all. Uh, and wow. it's possible that it could go lower than that. But in the 20s, I think it's something that that is is, is imminent. It, the question of, of course, when it could be in the 2030s when that happens, it could take that long. 
because there's yeah. going to be a hell of a lot of interventions like the Bardi has been. And so it's taking longer than it should have. But this is yeah. uh, this is basically what's setting up. There's absolutely no way that 2011 was the blow off top for bullying. The blow off top for bullying is a different world. You're basically moving into a different world. And that's the sign that you're doing it. Uh, 2011 was just the beginning. I mean, that was just a, kind of the, the entree before the main course. An interesting man, James Henry <laughs> Anderson. So we, we'll, stay we'll, thirsty, we'll, my friend. <laughs> huh? <laughs> stay hungry and thirsty, James. You kind of look like that guy, Dale. Oh, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I, I should. Uh, I should be on camera. <laughs> anyway, uh, buddy, it's always great talking to you. I always learn, and sure. uh, so you could find him on X at James Henry and. And uh, your website, bro, and your YouTube channel? Sure. Uh, I'm on sdbullion.com. We're a top five retailer of high volume sales in gold and silver in the United States. And the Twitter handle is at James Henry Ann. And what's that a picture of? Oh, that's just a background. I'm sure that's somewhere in the Pacific out, out west in the United States. Okay. Okay. Nice. Uh, there's a couple more charts. A couple more oh, for oh. you guys. Remember, I just brought these last two up for... Okay. Yeah, uh, I saw a chart recently explaining that, you know, gold in terms of the S&P 500 is as cheap now as it was when President Nixon went full fiat petrodollar in 1971. And I double checked the notes and that's true. It's basically pretty, it's right in line. And if you look at the formation of that, that hill that we recently built, it looks a lot like the one from back then, you know, where it's slowly yeah. starting to roll over. Uh, so yeah, ultimately look at the conservative target of 2011 low, which is about 0.7. That, that is, we're going back to one to one S and P gold. That that's going to happen. That's the, it's, it, where do you getting, think they'll, where do you think they'll cross at, uh, 3000, 5,000? That's a really good question. I would imagine higher nominally because the, the way that the system set up, oh uh, yeah, yeah. The powers that be half to nominally make this S and P 500 look okay. good. 20,000? I mean, seven, 8,000 maybe, you know? Okay. All right. Uh, but, but yeah, but that's that's out here later on in this decade where it goes back toward one, you know, somewhere okay. in this area where this thing rolls over. But when it rolls, it rolls, right? So you have to be yeah. positioned. You don't want to be late in that that uh, position. And okay. it's a similar story on the Dow. I mean, a Dow is a terrible way to track the stock market because it's a cherry pick, you know, major stocks. But this season goes back further in the 1800s. And you can see it's a similar formation. Thank you, Notary Anderson. Yeah, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad when I get you to laugh. All right, uh, follow James. Uh, <laughs> we're entering this, uh, we're in the fourth turning. So, yeah. you know, get ready. And, and physical metal is part of it. Thank you very much, James. I'll talk to you June-ish. All right, buddy. Good talking to you. All right, bro. James Henry Anderson at James Henry and and do your buying of physical through him. He'll give you good advice. And that's a wrap for me for the week. Made it through another week with migraines. And, uh, you know, keep a good thought for me. I'm tired of them. And I'll see everyone on Monday. Have a great weekend. NCAA tournament. Great action. And uh, you action junkies, make your plans on Saturday for what you're going to do on Wednesday. And that's a wrap. Don't just count your pips, count your blessings. See everyone down the road. And you too, James. Thanks, thanks again, buddy. Hey, traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.